Hi, I'm Sammy Davies, and today I'm going to talk about some joint work with Janardan Kokarni, Jakob Tanarski, Thomas Rothfuss, and Yi Hao Zhang on scheduling with precedence constraints and communication delays. So a lot of you are familiar with scheduling, but maybe less so the model of precedence constraints or communication delays. So we'll take some time to set that up. We consider a set of n jobs denoted by j, where job little j has processing length p sub j, where a processing length just means the number of time steps that it takes to complete a job. And we process these jobs on a set of m identical machines. The objective that I'll be discussing today is minimizing make span. So uh, how quickly can you schedule all the jobs so that they're all completed? With the inclusion of precedence constraints on the job set J, we model this with this uh, little bracket here, where if J is less than J prime in the partial order, then J must be completed before any machine can begin to process J prime. We can represent this as a DAG. So like for this example over here, we have 10 jobs, J1, J2, all the way up to J10. We consider all the jobs to have unit processing length, meaning they only take one time step. And uh, the directed edges show uh, the precedence constraints. So for instance, J2 is less than J6 with respect to the partial order. Uh, another way to say this is that J2 is a predecessor of J6 or that J6 is a successor of J2. And then with the addition of communication delays, so for instance, here, we're gonna add the delay of three. More generally, this is denoted by C. Then for J less than J prime with respect to the partial order, if J and J prime are performed on different machines, then we can only start to execute J prime at least C time steps after the completion of J. So we'll unpack this definition a little bit by looking at a schedule and an example. So we have our same DAG, same communication delay of three over here. And now we consider that we have a set of 10 machines, so M1, M2, all the way up to M10. We have 10 machines on which to process our 10 jobs, and uh, this axis here is just representing the total time it will take to complete the jobs. So for instance, we have scheduled J1 on machine one at time zero. And now let's look at how these uh, communication delays come into effect here. So for instance here, we can see that J2 is scheduled on machine two at time zero, uh, but J2 was a predecessor of J6 here. J6 is performed on a machine that is different than the machine J2 is processed on. In particular, J6 is processed on machine one. So with our communication delay setting, that means that at least three time steps have to pass between the end of J2 and the start of J6. So J2 ends at time one, and then after one, two, three more time steps, so beginning at time four, we are now allowed to process J6. On the other hand, uh, let's look at like J2 and J7. So J2 and J7 are also, you know, predecessors and successors uh, respectively, but J2 and J7 are processed on the same machine, so they don't have to uh, go through that communication delay. So why do we care about the communication delay model um, in practice or in theory? So, you know, for starters, in practice, computing on parallel processors is, um, you know, ubiquitous in computing. And in particular, the communication delay is modeling the latency of transferring output from one job as input to another job between processors. So maybe it takes um, M1 some amount of time to send some information over to M2. And we see this arise in several settings that are um, very topical, in particular scheduling in large data centers, as well as DNN training. And in both of these settings, it's interesting to note that the communication delay might be huge relative to the number of jobs. So for C, our communication delay, and N, the number of jobs, you know, we want to think of working as maybe like C is equal to N to some small power or something like that. But the point being that this communication delay uh, could really dominate the the runtime if we're, we're not careful with how we're scheduling. So how hard is the problem of scheduling with precedence constraints and communication delays? So first, just scheduling on identical machines without precedence constraints, without communication delays, there's a p-task for that. Scheduling with precedence constraints on identical machines, the problem is at least very well understood. 
uh, this list scheduling algorithm, which is just a, a greedy algorithm, gives it 2 minus 1 over m approximation. And more recently, it's been shown that under a variant of the unique games conjecture, uh, there's um, a 2 minus epsilon approximation. It's NP hard to obtain for any constant epsilon. So now looking at both precedence constraints and communication delays in the model, the best known upper bound is that uh, it's a C plus 2 approximation using that greedy list scheduling algorithm. So again, when we're thinking of C as being very large, maybe like n to some power, then this is, you know, not great. Um, and it's MB hard to get like a 1 plus 1 over C plus 3 approximation. So when you think of C being large here, then you notice that this gap is huge between like a small constant and uh, potentially this function growing very large with n. In particular, the quest of finding a constant approximation algorithm for this problem is put on a list of the top 10 open problems in scheduling theory a little over 20 years ago. And then much more recently, Nikhil Banzal described the model as not understood at all and almost completely open. And uh, you know, people who've worked on this have hinted to the fact that this is likely because there were no promising LP or SDP relaxations to study the communication delay setting. So we have some progress here. Um, our main result is that there's a randomized log C log M approximation algorithm for the problem of scheduling with precedence constraints and communication delays. So in particular, let's remember here, C is the uh, communication delay, delay time, M is the number of machines. We can think of C and M as being at most N. So this is like a log N squared approximation algorithm in the worst case. And there's another result in Fox, which gets a rather similar result. So um, Mati et al, they show that there is a polylog approximation algorithm for the problem as well. And their techniques are very different than ours. You should definitely watch their talk as well as ours. Um, you know, they show that uh, they can approximate the problem with duplication in the duplication setting, and then bound the advantage that duplication actually gives for this problem. So you learn very different things from seeing uh, this talk versus their talk. And for today, we're going to talk about this main result. We're going to show um, how, uh, how we get this log C log M approximation algorithm for the objective of minimizing make span. So we'll begin with some simplifying assumptions to keep in mind as we develop an algorithm. We can assume um, a few things, assuming that we're willing to lose a constant factor, which we totally are since we're you know, just working towards a polylog approximation. We can assume that all jobs have processing length one. Okay, so in other words, after they are scheduled, they only take one time step until they're completed. We can also assume that we have n jobs, where n, uh, sorry, n machines, where n is the number of jobs. In other words, you can have as many machines as you would like. Lastly, we'll assume that the time horizon is partitioned into C length intervals. So instead of, um, having to assign each job to one time step. Instead, we're just gonna worry about assigning jobs into C length intervals and then um, just taking any topological um, ordering with respect to that partial order and that will be a sufficient schedule for that interval. So for instance, as we consider uh, this DAG here on the set of 10 jobs that we had before, what we mean by scheduling into C length intervals is um, we'll look at the time horizon as being partitioned now into like of this first length C interval denoted by I0, and then this second length C interval denoted by I1. And so for instance, we only care about J2, J3, and J7 being scheduled on some machine together and being scheduled in that interval I0. So I said before that uh, there was like a lack of promising LP or SDP relaxations for this problem. So let's introduce um, a little bit about RLP. So the variables that we're mainly going to work with today are these y sub j j primes, which indicate the probability that jobs j and j prime are scheduled on the same machine and in the same C length interval. So going back to this picture, it would be like, for instance, looking at j3 and j7, the probability that j3 and j7 are scheduled on the same machine in the same interval. So in like this time block on this machine, or for instance, like this is another time block on another machine. 
So using those y variables here, uh, I want to introduce these first three constraints all at once. So first, uh, this first constraint here is representing a triangle inequality on 1 minus y. So we're enforcing that. We're also enforcing symmetry on the y variables and like an identity condition. So together, um, these three constraints are going to allow us to set up a metric on 1 minus y. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later, uh, but for now let's move on to some of the other constraints. We also introduce these variables cj, which I'm going to call completion time of time, completion time of job j. And cj is indicating uh, the index of the interval where j is processed. So for instance, like i0 or i1 for, you know, respectively. Now in particular here, uh, this constraint that we're enforcing on the completion times with respect to the y's is for jobs which um, are represented in the partial order here. So in particular, this is representing that if j is less than j prime in the partial order, and if j and j prime are scheduled on different machines, then they have to be in different C length intervals. So let's unpack that for a sec. So this y, j, j prime, if we think of that as being equal to zero, which would mean, you know, that with no probability j and j prime are scheduled on the same machine in the same interval, then with zero here, we have that cj prime is at least cj plus one. So in other words, their intervals must be separated by at least one. They have to be in different C length intervals. Then this last constraint I won't say too much about. Um, for a fixed job j, we're looking at the sum of the yj j prime variables over all j prime. And you can think of this as like, uh, like almost like the expected number of jobs that will be occurring in the same interval on the same machine as some fixed job J. So it's like saying you can't schedule more than C jobs in um, one of those C length intervals on one machine. So you're not overcrowding any machine and interval. So as I said before, these three constraints together, I fibbed a little, these three constraints Together, uh, we're going to use to form this distance function d. So d is equal to 1 minus y, and this distance is a semi-metric, which is, you know, think about it as a metric for all intents and purposes, with the exception that uh, the distance between two jobs might be zero, even if like j and j prime are not the same. So now we have a semi-metric placed on the set of jobs, and we're going to be able to use some tools from the theory of metric spaces then. So let's talk a bit more about that. In particular, we're going to use um, a clustering algorithm from like the literature on metric spaces. So we have the distance function d, and now we're going to use this clustering algorithm by Kalinescu, Karloff, and Rabani. So instead of um, you know considering these jobs in this DAG, we can consider these jobs as you know points in space where there's this distance function between them. So in particular, you know the distance between j6 and j9 is one minus y sub j6 j9. And what we're going to do here is we're going to use this clustering algorithm to cluster jobs with close completion time. So I'm going to look at a set where the, the index of the interval where the jobs are processed are all very close together, like within a 1 over log c factor. I'm going to cluster those jobs in J star that have very close completion time, and then just repeat this over a partition of the completion times. So for the rest of today, um, we're going to talk about really just clustering on a set of jobs that have close completion time. So we use this CKR algorithm, this algorithm by Kalinescu, Karloff, and Rabani, and there's some uh, nice properties that make it work for our purposes of scheduling. First off, these clusters that we're gonna obtain on the sets of jobs, uh, they only contain jobs which are parallelized likely to be scheduled on the same machine in the same C length interval. The clusters are not too big. So remember in our example here, C was equal to three. We're only gonna get um, clusters of like order C. In fact, we'll show it's like less than two C. And if you consider a set J prime, which is some job J and then all of its predecessors, which are in that close completion set J star, then the probability that the nodes in J prime are assigned to more than one cluster. So like they're separated and you have some jobs of j prime in one cluster and some jobs of j prime in another cluster. Uh, this happens with small probability. It's at most one half. 
And this is important because if we're going to be able to schedule a job, we need to make sure it's scheduled with all of its predecessors that have not yet been scheduled in order to like satisfy the, the precedence constraints. So I'm going to introduce an algorithm. Um, and then we're going to run through an example of it. So this algorithm, we're going to start with those jobs that have close completion time. We're calling this set J star. And then while there is some job in J star which has not been scheduled, so J star is not empty, we're running CKR on that set J star equipped with that distance function D to get some clusters V1 to VK. Then we take the downward closed subsets of the clusters, and those are going to end up being the sets that we're actually allowed to schedule. Because like we said before, you can only schedule jobs which are, you know, scheduled with their predecessors that are still remaining to be scheduled. And then with those downward closed subsets, we can schedule each subset on one machine, and that takes time at most 2C, so not that large. And then uh, we insert like idle time C after all of the schedules on each machine and repeat this, trying to reschedule the remaining jobs in J star. And we do this for log M iterations. Um, and then after that much time, you can just schedule the rest of the jobs on one machine with high probability. I know that was a little fast. So we're going to go through an example, uh, running through how exactly this kind of clustering algorithm works with scheduling. And I'll keep the algorithm up here, highlighting each step as we go. Um, so let's see. So with round one, we start with all 10 of our jobs here. 10 of our jobs in our uh, like that are supposed to be laid out with how close and far they are with respect to that distance function D. We run CKR and we get a set of clusters circled by this orange here. And now we're taking the subsets of the clusters which are downward closed. So for instance, let's consider this J6, J7, J2 cluster. When we go over to our graph here and we look at J6, J7, J2, well, J6 has J1 as a predecessor and J1 is in a different cluster, okay? So we are not gonna be considering J6 to be in that downward closed set. Similarly, J7 has J3 as a predecessor and J3 is in a different cluster than J7. So we can schedule J2. Looking over here, we can schedule both J1 and J5 because this is a downward closed set. And we can schedule J3, J4, and J8 as this is also a downward closed set. So now we take those little red subsets that we circled before. We schedule one on each machine. So J3, J4, J8 is scheduled on machine 10, J2 on machine two, J1 and J5 on machine one. So we have our 10 machines. We have scheduled the downward closed uh, subsets that we can. We insert C idle time, which is going to be accounting for the communication delay between iterations. And now we start over on the remaining jobs left. So we remove the jobs that we already scheduled and we start again. So now we have J6, J7, J9, J10. We run CKR, we get some clusters. We take our downward closed subsets. So here note that J7, J10 is downward closed. Um, J9 is not downward closed because J9 is separated from its predecessor J7. But J6 is all right to be scheduled as well. So we schedule J6 on some machine, and then J7 and J10 on another machine, insert idle time, C, idle time C, and move on. So now, uh, you know, you can keep on doing this. Eventually, we'll get to a point where there's like a very small number of jobs left that you can just schedule together. And so you do exactly that, scheduling J9 in that last C length interval. So this is our complete schedule, where we've run that clustering algorithm taken the downward closed subsets to account for the precedence constraints, and then inserted C idle time between iterations to account for the communication delays occurring between iterations. So that's it for the algorithm. Um, to mention some future work, the real big open question here is whether or not there is a constant approximation algorithm for scheduling with precedence constraints and communication delays. Recall that we give a log C log M, or you know, think of that as log N squared approximation. Uh, so our work has been extended to the uh, related machine setting and to minimize the weighted sum of completion time. 
So we talk a little bit about minimizing weighted sum of completion time in this paper, and then in another paper, we extend it completely to the related machine setting as well. And today we talked about the uniform communication delay setting. So for instance, the delay between every pair of jobs uh, was the same, it was just some fixed C. As soon as you look at non-uniform communication delays, so for instance, for all J and J prime, uh, where J is less than J prime, the communication delay might be like some small, you know, zero or one, and then some very large, like N to the one half or something. And here we also don't know a lot about the hardness or approximation algorithms. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much.